people were always a little bit thrown off when I said that a big part of my fundraising was like giving people an out. Like in my fundraising emails and my conversations, I would always say like, it is no problem whatsoever if this is not a right fit for you. And people were always like, couldn't believe I was like letting people off the hook. And I did it because it made me as a fundraiser feel so much more comfortable. And because what I wanted was alignment, not money. Anyone can get a gift one time. Anyone can get that business one time. But if you want sustainable, reliable funding, then alignment is where to focus. And now there's all this science to support that actually when you give people opt-outs, they're way more likely to say yes. People trust you so much more when they don't think you just want their money at all costs, even if it's not the right fit for them. Welcome to the Impact Roadmap, a podcast designed to give you the practical, concrete steps to grow your nonprofit or future forward business in a sustainable way. I'm your host, Joey Goon. Let's get into the episode. Hey, y'all. I want to welcome Mallory Erickson to the Impact Roadmap podcast. Mallory, it is so nice to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here and for our conversation. I am so excited to have you. So uh, just kind of in summary, your bio, you're an executive coach, you're a fundraising consultant and a host of the What the Fundraising podcast. And I love your your mission statement and your mantra, which is that you help nonprofits raise more money from the right donors without hounding people for money. So I'm super excited uh, to talk more about this, uh, just like being an entrepreneur in, in general, how to scale a company thoughtfully, because I think these things... Um, you know, these, these lessons kind of apply to whether you're running a nonprofit or a for-profit business and the things you talk about. So let's go deep and wide. And as you like to say, get real and raw. <laughs> I'm in, let's do it. So, um, by the way, your AI bot is trying to enter the, uh, oh, kick it out. I let it in. Just ki- no, no, you can kick it out. Okay. Just uh, reject it. It's no problem. Sorry about no that. Worries. It follows me everywhere. That is amazing. <laughs> what is this? Let's talk about that. Like, what does your AI bot do for you? Because I think one of the things we're going to talk about today is like automating systems and processes and thinking differently about problems and energy and all of that. And like mm. an AI bot, an AI bot and automation can do a lot for you. What does yours do for you? Yeah. So this, it's kind of a funny story, what led me to it. So it goes to all my meetings, it takes notes, it creates kind of summaries and time stamps of the meeting itself. And for me, it is really nice because I have ADHD. And so when I'm in a meeting with someone, I am like listening super intently. I am in it. And I believe so badly in that moment that I'm going to remember everything that we talked about. And then I go right from that meeting to another meeting. And again, I'm in the conversation. Conversation. I'm so focused and I'm convinced that I'm going to remember everything that we talked about. And then I get to the end of the day and I'm like, wait, what were the things what I happened? was supposed to do? <laughs> and so this wonderful AI bot now takes care of that for me. And so I can go back into meeting notes and, um, you know, find what the next steps were, what the action items were, make sure I sort of convert those over to my to-do list. So it's been game changing for me and it sends the notes to the guest of my call as well. So both people get it which is really nice, which is how I found out about it. Actually, in the first place, I was on a call with somebody's bot and I got the email after and I was like, oh my God, I need this. Um, So welcome my AI bot. Welcome AI bot. Thank you for joining (laughs) us. Uh, That's really incredible. Really incredible. So we're going to come back to that in just a moment. But before we do, um, please fill in any gaps about you that I left out of your bio. Yeah, no, I I mean, I think that that's what I do. And I, I've spent my career in the nonprofit sector and I was a fundraiser for a long time accidentally because that's what happens to a lot of us in the nonprofit sector. We get promoted up and find ourselves in roles that come with big fundraising responsibilities. And I hated fundraising. Um, and what fundamentally changed my experience as a fundraiser was getting executive coach certified, which was not tied to my fundraising at the time. Um, but going through that process, getting trained in habit and behavior design and design thinking, those frameworks really transformed the way that I fundraised. And then I just wanted to share what I learned with everybody I could. And that's what led me to ultimately and almost accidentally building a business, um, doing what I do today. Where, where are you from? I grew up in the Bay Area outside of San Francisco here. And then I was gone for about 10 years in Boston, New York, Michigan, Latin America, and then found my way back home. Nice. Really cool. Yeah. So uh, you, you shared with us a little bit about why you decided to start this business. 
What's what has been the biggest challenge that you've had as an entrepreneur in scaling this business? Yeah, you know, it's so funny. I was thinking about this today, actually, related to something else. But I, so my business, I never set out to be an entrepreneur. I'm actually the daughter of an entrepreneur, but I never was like that. That's my identity. But during, at the beginning of COVID, uh, what we started to see in the nonprofit sector was this mass paralysis around fundraising. There was this narrative, it's inappropriate to fundraise right now. And with my coaching background, I was like, this is a place I can really help. Like I can really help people coach over the resistance that they're feeling right now to taking fundraising action. And so I offered this like free, I said, oh, I'm going to group coach people around fundraising fears. Come on Monday. I posted this on a Friday. I had a 10 month old at home, no child care, a full-time job. And I went to bed and I woke up and 180 people had signed up. Oh. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm not going to group coach. First of all, I guess I'm gonna have to learn what a webinar is. And so I ended up doing this webinar for a thousand people over the course of 2020, and then requests to work with me one-on-one -on -one started to flood in. And I was still fundraising, frontline fundraising in my normal job. And I was like, okay, but I want to help. So I created a course, a program called the Power Partners Formula, which walks people through how you combine fundraising strategy with executive coaching, with habit and behavior design and design thinking. And I launched that in 2021. And I think, and then, and then I left my role and I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this full time. I'm really passionate about it. I wanna help as many fundraisers as I can. I think there have been a lot of different challenges to scaling. You know, one has been honestly building and scaling a business in the middle of a pandemic. And that has meant different things to different people. But here in California, it meant a lot of unreliable childcare. And I had a little one the whole time. So when I look back at like the amount of time I was really able to work, like childcare would close down for two weeks anytime there was any exposure of COVID at the school. So there would just be two week blocks constantly throughout the last two years where I would have no childcare support or, you know, we would we would get sick from something and, you know, then you don't have childcare again for whatever reason it is. And um, I think there was just a lot of life in the last few years that made, that has made me need to have a lot of compassion for myself around the speed at which I have or haven't scaled. Um, and, you know, I live in a really expensive part of the country. And so, I, one of the other challenges for me has definitely been not feeling like I had a lot of give to take risks when maybe I wish I had, like, I wish I had really doubled down on scaling power partners instead of taking one-on-one -on -one clients. But in the moment, I didn't feel like I had that flexibility to sort of build up over a few months. Um, and so I think that, that continues to be a challenge for me, like the short term, um, short-term cash flow versus long-term momentum building and the way that your time sort of divides up between those two in the different services I provide. That was a lot of information, but it gives you kind of an inside look at uh, what I've built and what's been hard and, and good about it. Yeah, that, that, was, that was really good. Really good. I wrote down um, things like, um, just things that I think we should spend more time talking about, which is self-compassion. Um, focusing on the business versus in the business in the business is kind of like looking at, you know, like very, you know, zoomed in, um, mm -hmm. on like operational cash flow management systems and processes, running the day-to-day -day activities versus on the business allows you to pull the lens back and kind of look at things from a blue sky perspective. Like what, what is this bigger thing that we're trying to build and how can we continue to, you know, to, um, to add value to people, um, and I, I loved the idea of not feeling like I could take risks because I too felt actually, um, I too have gone through that and went through that during like 2020 and, you know, mm -hmm. namely in the pandemic, like we, we had to take risks because it was evolve or die. And we actually had Steve Johns on a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. who's the CEO of one cause. And he talked about leadership lessons at the crossroads and how their risks were, um, it's like when you embrace risk and you use it as sort of an, an opportunity to to learn or to fail. Those failures can become your biggest learning lessons and opportunities, which is really interesting. But I can totally empathize with the fact of like not being in a position to feel like you can take risks because there are so many other things that you're focused on. Um, so let, can we talk 
let's let's talk a little bit more about that mm. because I know that's that's something that you coach on. Let's talk about risks and relationship with risks and learning and being curious. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting as you were sort of repeating that back to me, I was, I was thinking, I was like, you know, Mallory, you took a lot of risks in your business. Like there were a lot of things that you did. I think where I really struggled with risk, and this relates to, I think what a lot of folks deal with is when I was given an opportunity that I needed to say no to. It was like the risks that I struggled with were like not not making the quick yes, right? Like, okay, this big opportunity came my way, but it's going to take all of this time and not sort of recognizing that the risk is in the no. Um, Because I think sometimes we think about risk as this really conscious choice. Okay, I'm going to take this risk to launch this program, to put myself out there, to send a proposal to a publisher, to do these things. And I do risks like that all the time when I have that level of consciousness around like, I'm going to be brave and I'm going to do something scary and I'm going to work through that fear. Where I think I struggle with risk taking is in that automatic yes that sometimes keeps me feeling safer in the moment, but doesn't allow me to really um, like live out the full um, desire that I have around that risk I initially took. That makes a whole lot of sense, totally. And I and I think that many people feel challenged by that. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. but I mean, is is maybe part of the issue here is like right person, right seat, and like having the team around you that can support you. So you are available to take those bigger risks. Cause like myself, like the biggest challenge for me is something that I call heroing is like shouldering the burden of all the things that I feel like I need to get done instead Mm. of thoughtfully delegating. And so sometimes Mm. I feel like it's an inconvenience to ask my team to do things, or I don't want them to think that I'm lazy, which is kind of ludicrous because they know how much I care about this business. Mm. But that, that ends up, like it, it, it's at my own expense because I take mm-hmm. on too many tasks that don't fulfill me, that are not in my zone of genius, that don't bring me mm-hmm. joy, like the admin tasks and paying the bills and writing blogs or copy for social media posts that are not superpowers for me. And like I've started to realize and notice that my superpower is connecting with and loving on people and making people feel special and building relationships. And when I do that, I feel alive and I feel like I'm contributing and it becomes a game of like figuring out how I can add value to someone. And when I add value, I'm like, wow, I'm making a difference. Mm. And, and so anyway, I went through this. This is really interesting because we're hiring right now for a director of business development. And it's been recommended to me by one of my friends in EO, which is um, just a, an entrepreneur's mastermind group, to do this personality assessment. Mm. And she sent me this a link to this thing. And this assessment, what I found out was spot on and that I'm a rainmaker and a rainmaker likes to be in the middle of it and create opportunities and um, they're gregarious and colorful and they motivate, but they also fight rules and structure because they're nonconformist and that can be a, a good thing and a bad thing. But in any case, the point I'm trying to make here is like, I think a lot of the scaling problems that we all collectively have in business and maybe fundraising in general too is like right person, wrong skill set, mm-hmm. wrong seat. Would you agree or disagree? And like, can you take more risks as the entrepreneur if you have the right people there supporting you? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think, you know, in my next phase of business growth, this is going to be the piece I'm exploring. I have, I do not have a team. I mean, I have a VA 10 to 15 hours a week and it's me. So the scaling really has happened by me. And I think part of my decision to do that was also because of what I mentioned before around some of the instability with, um, you know, childcare. I got diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. There were like all these personal things where I was like, I want to be able to prioritize like work-life harmony and my health. And I feel like if I hire another person right now, the pressure is going to be really on to support a team financially. And I just wasn't in a personal place to to do that. And I think I now like things have changed and, you know, I'm, I'm healthy and I, I have 
had a lot of things happen in my personal life that have, have led me into a path of being like, okay, now I feel more ready to like think about building a team. And so I think you're right. I think, you know, and, and so I think for folks who are in my shoes where like they are all the things and there is no one to delegate those things to, although I have been very strategic about what my VA does and does not do. And those, and the things that she does are the things I am the worst at. And in fact, I have picked a lot of systems that I intentionally do not let myself learn how to use. So I don't touch them. Like I moved, I have moved to different systems that are like too complicated that I know I won't figure out easily. And so I don't touch them at all. Um, and to sort of like safeguard things from me. Um, and, and then I think, you know, one of the challenges when you are wearing, you know, multiple hats still is like, creating that time and that space and those buffers to like shift between, okay, I'm, I need to put on my like big thinking, working on the business hat now. And now there I need to go and like do that thing or figure out why that thing happened and kind of those shifts back and forth. How do you stay in, you, you talk about catabolic versus anabolic energy. Mm. How do you stay in an anabolic energy state when you're doing, when you're like you're sort of in flux, you know, you're kind of, you're always mm. bouncing back and forth between working on and in the business. Are there, help us understand, like, how do you personally stay in an anabolic state to keep from getting overwhelmed? Because again, a moment ago, you talked about one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is very time intensive opposed to coaching mm. groups. You've got to keep yourself in that very high minded state. How yeah. do you do that? There are two things that I think about pretty much constantly. One is choice, conscious choice. So every one of the things that I think leads to the most catabolic energy is when we feel trapped. And so even in moments where I'm like, you know, like that narrative I told you before around, like I wasn't in a financial position to take a lot of risk. Like I try to use words that are like, you know, I made a choice. Like it felt like I didn't have a lot of, you know, opportunity to take a lot of risk, but consistently reinforcing for myself that I have choice and I have choices. And I took on these one-on-one -on -one clients because I really wanted to support their growth around blank, blank, blank. And even just like that moment of reminding ourselves that we have choice and autonomy can really help move us back into more of an anabolic energy. When we go into something, we're like, oh, I have to do this because I have to pay the bills. And like, that's when we get like dragged down by the energy because we feel trapped and we feel choiceless and we feel at the effect of our life. The other thing, there are two other things, actually, I'm going to add one more thing that add to like my like quick shifts into anabolic energy. One is curiosity. I am just like an insanely, genuinely curious person. And I think catabolic energy is filled with black and white thinking, right or wrong, binary ways of being. And I am just always like, what about or what if and what would be possible if and just those tiny little questions to myself always, even even when I'm stressed running from a one on one meeting to a group coaching session, I can just ask myself, okay, what, what might happen if next time you gave yourself an hour buffer instead of a 30 minute buffer, just that moment of curiosity, that moment of, um, you know, re releasing the, oh, you shouldn't have done this Mallory, like this always happens. And then you're so stressed running from thing to thing, like that helps keep us in anabolic energy. And then the third thing is like acknowledging and validating my feelings. Like one of the things we think that there, I, we just have this like culture around like tough love, like is like what we need, you know, to progress and grow. And we totally underestimate the way that acknowledging and validating how we feel actually diffuses catabolic energy. It gets us into a place of clarity and it actually helps us move forward. And acknowledging and validating how we feel doesn't mean we're accepting the entire situation necessarily. It doesn't mean we don't want to change the situation in the future, but just saying, oh yeah, this like sucks right now. <laughs> and like, I'm feeling super uncomfortable about it. And I'm kind of regretting that I made this decision. And like, that's okay. Like, it makes sense that I feel the way I feel because, you know, this is not my favorite thing to do. And just having that moment actually allows me to like be done with it and move forward. 
I love it. You talk about the great reframe, which is mm -hmm. like, I choose to do this or I get to do this versus I have to do this. And like knowing that you have mm -hmm. autonomy, like you as an entrepreneur out there, a CEO, an executive director, a frontline fundraiser, whatever you're doing in the world, like you are making a conscious decision to do that thing. And that's fantastic. But like, you don't, you don't have to do any of those things. Mm -hmm. And I love that reframe. You also talk about curiosity and, um, I don't know. Are you familiar with appreciative inquiry? No. Dr. David Cooper writer, you should check this out. You would get a kick out of this. So appreciative inquiry is all about a curiosity mindset around asking questions versus feeling that we need to have all the answers. And um, Astro Teller, who's a former executive at Google, talks about sort of this interesting thing that's going on right now where the demands in humans' environments are changing faster than our ability to adapt to those demands. And so people feel like they have to be able to answer those demands and have answers for all of the things that are vying for our attention. And, mm -hmm. and it, the reality is we don't have to know the answers to the things. We just have to approach life with a curiosity and ask the right mm -hmm. questions. And then the answers reveal themselves. Mm, I love that. It's, uh, it's really interesting. And I definitely, I really appreciate and acknowledge and respect your ability to think introspectively by asking yourself thoughtful questions. Mm, super, thank super cool. You. Thank you. It, I mean, I, it has also been a huge part of releasing things like imposter syndrome or, um, you know, a lot of different types of self-doubt. Like I walk into situations and I'm like, I know I don't have all the answers. <laughs> I am positive. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> I am positive. I am probably not the smartest person in the room. I am positive that somebody knows X, Y, and Z better than I do, but I am very curious. And so it gives me the confidence and the humility, I think, to like go into those moments and be like, yeah, like if you know more about this than me, like tell me about it, you know, and then let's talk about it. Wow. You talk a lot about abundance versus scarcity and, mm -hmm. and how our energy, like there, you know, there's, there's a difference between like scarcity is that there's not enough for everybody. And our energy is created and evolves around these like predetermined thoughts and beliefs that we adopt from our families and our friends. Like how do we change our default and condition tendencies and beliefs and shift our beliefs to adopt new abundant minded beliefs? Because I think a lot of the challenge around scarcity, and you speak to this quite frequently, I've listened to some of your podcasts and, and your your content that's out there. You talk about people are so committed to being right. And when we can let mm. go of that and be open and vulnerable and be okay being wrong and learning from others, this incredible opportunity presents itself. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that to me, the framework around catabolic and anabolic energy, one of the things that was so enlightening for me about getting about understanding and being trained in that framework at first was this piece around rightness. And I think there are a lot of things that that impact our our desire for rightness. There, I mean, there are a lot of um, psychologists and neuroscientists who would point to different types of trauma and early childhood experiences that lead to that. There are, you know, our perfectionist tendencies lead to rightness. Like I said before, like our imposter syndrome, our fear. I mean, rightness is a protection mechanism, right? Like our commitment to being right is our desire to protect ourselves from something. Mm. And whether that thing is like something mean that we could say to ourselves, if I'm not right, then what am I doing here? If I'm not right, then I don't deserve to be the executive director of this organization. If I'm not right, then I'm not enough, right? So some of it is protection wow. from the self-talk that might come if we admit that we weren't right there. And so the every form of binary thinking, in my opinion, is a form of protection. Same with scarcity mindset. It's like, oh, if I just believe there's not enough, then if I don't get that thing, it's not my fault. It's because there's not enough. Because there's not enough out there. It's, it's all about protection. And what's so hard, and, and you know, there are a lot of different ways in the nervous system that you could describe what that protection looks like, right? That that's when our sympathetic nervous system is activated, we're in fight or flight mode. And, and there are times when protection is really important. You know, the thing is, catabolic energy is not just always bad. Like, 
there's a time and a place for catabolic energy and anabolic energy. When, if you just went through something incredibly hard, sometimes going into catabolic energy, going into that protection, withdrawing from other people, having, you know, a, a moment where you're, or some time where you're withdrawn and you're in that protection mode, you might be so tender that that's important for you right then. Like that if you were to be more open and vulnerable in that moment when you're so tender, that it could send you into complete, you know, paralysis and overwhelm or burnout, you know, phases. So it's not that catabolic energy is is always bad. It's about recognizing when do we have choice and control over our interaction with catabolic energy and when and when do we have the ability to um, move ourselves out of it because chronically being in catabolic energy is also going to lead us to burnout and overwhelm and paralysis. Um, I highly recommend if you if you're listening to this podcast, you go back and listen to that bit about four thousand more times. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> so someone who I, um, someone who I really admire and I've admired over the last 10 years, I've known him is Dr. Ben Hardy. I don't know if mm. you know his work, but he mm -hmm. has a book called personality isn't permanent. And mm. he talks about how first beliefs are ideas or ideologies. Then they become beliefs. Then they become personality traits. Then they become a part of our identities or like baked into us. Mm. And the further down that path we go, the harder it is to break the belief or behavior. Mm. And so we are the beliefs and the thoughts that we've had over and over again. And those become rooted in our identity and eventually become a part of our personalities. But his point is personality is not permanent. So you can start changing the narrative. So from your perspective, what are the tactics and strategies or practices like yoga, gratitude, journaling, meditate, like anything, mm. even getting outside and getting in, getting, taking your shoes off and going out in nature and spending some time, like what are the practices you'd recommend to people to start changing that narrative from scarcity to abundance and more energy in their lives? Mm. Yeah. So I love, you know, what you were explaining about his work, because a lot of what I talk about is around this cognitive behavior loop. So the idea that our thoughts and our beliefs inform how we feel and then ultimately what we do and the actions that we take. So he's showing the way that thoughts and beliefs lead to, uh, you know, personality, identity, all those deeper things. And I'm and I'm looking at, OK, how do those things impact our, our reality in the present moment? And the reason I'm saying this is because I actually think the very first practice is just awareness around how you feel in certain moments and then taking a moment to ask yourself, what is the thought and the belief that might be impacting how I feel? So we take our feelings a lot of times as fact. And I just want to say this very clearly, our feelings being valid are different than our feelings being true. And so your feelings are always valid, like acknowledge and validate your feelings. But what led to those feelings and the circumstances and the interpretation or the story you've made up might not necessarily be true. And so if we can take that moment to say, okay, I'm uncomfortable in my belly right now. Like I feel a lot of resistance. I feel kind of nauseous. Like what are, why am I feeling that? Like what are some of the thoughts and the beliefs that I'm holding right now that might be making that feeling come up? And when I did this in fundraising, what I found was, okay, I was getting that really uncomfortable feeling right before walking into a donor meeting. And when I asked myself that question, okay, why, why do I feel so uncomfortable right now? What came up was, you know, I think that asking people for money is like, is like asking people to do something that they don't really want to do. And you're trying to figure out this like maybe manipulative way to like get them to say yes, because they have money and you don't have money and you need some of their money. And it was like, yeah, like no wonder I felt so uncomfortable. Like those thoughts and those beliefs about fundraising are never going to feel good. And so I was like, okay, like, what do I want to believe? Uh, like, what do I really believe good fundraising can be and is? And what do I want to believe walking into these meetings? And I was like, that great fundraising is not an ask. It's an offer that it's about partnership and opportunity and collaboration and connection. And so I worked on developing that belief in myself and, and deciding, okay, what types of fundraising practices make it an offer, not an ask? How can I say things differently? And, and so 
I'm, I'm going deep on this belief piece here. And then I'll talk about some like other practices to help you tap into this. But I think just awareness around your feelings is like the very, very, very first step, because that's also what's going to trigger for you. Ooh, I got to go walk outside, or maybe I need to take a few moments for deep breathing. I find that when we try to schedule meditation or, you know, yoga or things like that, not that they don't work. They're still incredibly, I mean, I'm a sort of, I was a certified yoga instructor. Like I deeply believe in, in, um, in yoga practices, but I think sometimes those rituals become compartmentalized to that time. And the way to really impact your energy throughout the day is to, is to like integrate those pieces. And I think that starts with the awareness in the moment around like how you're actually feeling and then play with some things, try a deep breathing technique. You know, you want to call, if you're feeling anxious, you want to do shorter inhales, longer exhales. If you're feeling like you need to get your energy up, longer inhales, shorter exhales, try it out, see how it feels. Put on your favorite song, dance it out, jump around your house, see how that impacts your energy. Go take that walk, go outside, put your phone away. You know, like people always ask like, is it bad that I watch three hours of Netflix every night? And I'm like, that's that's not, like, I cannot answer that. How do you feel after you watch three hours of Netflix? Because if you feel refreshed and inspired and excited and you sleep great, then sounds like it's a great habit for you. But if you're doom scrolling the whole time you're on Netflix, you finish three hours, you beat yourself up about it, you forgot to eat dinner and you don't sleep very well, maybe it's a habit to look at. The action is never the thing. It's like, how is that action impacting you? And awareness around ourselves is the first part of that. It's beautiful. Um, speaking of breathing techniques, you're familiar with the Wim Hof method? Yes. Have you done fan. it? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, well, I'm a big fan of his work. Um, I do cold therapy. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. I did, I did my fourth ice bath at a retreat, uh, just a couple of weeks ago in San Diego. And we had a Wim Hof facilitator come out to our Airbnb that was on the beach in San Diego, right there on the pier area. And people are walking by and we had this ice bath and we're doing like tribal breathing before we get in the ice bath and like dancing. Oh. And he kind of framed it as like, you know, there, there was a study that was done. You, you mentioned dancing in your kitchen and flipping on a song, right. And just like dancing it out. There was a study that was done and I don't know the exact study, but they measured people's levels of oxytocin and dopamine. And they had them do a, a ton of different activities mm -hmm. and the highest levels of oxytocin and dopamine were generated in the bloodstream when people danced in communities, mm -hmm. they put people together and had them dance as a group. And mm -hmm. And that's when the highest level of oxytocin was, was, um, um, elicit that, mm. that response was elicited in the body. And so we danced on the beach before we jumped into our ice bath. So maybe, maybe you might want to dance tonight in your kitchen after listening to this podcast episode, but <laughs> so yeah. many great tips there. And I think it, I love that you shared that story because I think it also double clicks on a strategy, which is human connection. Yeah. Like, you know, that is one of the most underutilized and um, recognized ways of regulating our nervous system in modern society, like like underutilized and under recognized in modern society is human connection and community. And so that absolutely is a is a strategy for folks to be thinking about how they can have more of those moments that feel good for them. So true. And in our, I mean, in our company, we're all about trying to re-engineer why and how people come together. Mm -hmm. You know, we're helping our nonprofits think differently about bringing people together, get rid of the rubber chicken dinner and create an environment where your donors and your attendees and your prospective donors and your sponsors and your stakeholders, or if you're producing a conference where your employees and other stakeholders, mm -hmm. board members can turn to each other and connect with each other and mm -hmm. learn with each other and explore like, wow, I didn't realize you have the same values as me. Let's go out to dinner as a couple next week. Like if you can form those bonds through your event, mm -hmm. then, then you're doing a great service to your entire community and they're going to come back and come back again because you're helping them generate communal capital, which isn't mm -hmm. oftentimes the reason why people go to a thing, but it's more than more than not, it's oftentimes the reason that they're going to come back. Hmm, I love that. 
Let's talk about, um, like we, why is it so weird to be able to sell ourselves? <laughs> like, why is that? Feel, <laughs> like, I, it's, it's very hard. Like when I talk about our business, I'm extremely passionate. Like it's very meaningful for me, but for me to say, Hey, Mallory, if you're ever producing a mastermind or a retreat or a seminar, you know, and you want us AV in the room or good event production team to help v- hold video cameras and capture it all and bring the tech in the room. Yeah. Hire us. Like to me, that feels fine because I'm not pitching you. But if I were genuinely mm-hmm. pitching you, it's a lot harder for me to say those things with feeling like and feel congruent and confident than it is for me to go and like an hour from now, if I'm talking to a, a nonprofit friend of mine and they're like, gosh, I'm just hitting a wall. What do I do? It's a lot easier for me to say, oh, you got to call Mallory. You know, it's easy to refer others. It's hard to advocate for ourselves. Why is that? Okay. I'm sure there's some science here that I cannot quote, but I am now going to look it up after we talk. Um, because I do know, like there's some science around, like the, uh, around asking where like we are biologically much more comfortable asking for something on behalf of someone else than we are for asking for something for ourselves, which is very similar, right? It's kind of like a piece of this is like, um, is that, but then there's the endorsement piece. I mean, I think, look, I think, I think there's a few pieces. I think one is that, you know, we never want to come off as, um, like we've complicated relationships with seeming like arrogant or like with our, with our egos. I also think, I think there might be a piece of this. This is not a fully fleshed out idea that is also related a little bit to the binary thinking that like capitalism leads us to. And I think this is related a little bit to scarcity mindset as well. I think we don't always believe that we can both win. And so we think that if I win, you don't win. And so we sort of are have some resistance to coming across too strongly with what we want because we're afraid it leaves the perception that the other person isn't going to get what they want necessarily. And like, I have this sort of different example, but my husband recently was dealing with something at work and I told him that he should read Never Split the Difference, which is a negotiation book. And he was like, you think this is a negotiation? And I said, yeah, I think any time like you're trying to get something that you want, it is in some way a negotiation. I think what makes you really uncomfortable about the fact that I use that word is that you believe you getting what you want means he won't get what he wants. And I think good negotiation is both people getting what they want. And I think the best fundraising relationships, the best promotion of our services are in those moments and in those interactions where we're really working towards both people getting what they want, you know? And so like, I think in that moment, if your friend's pain point was their event business, like, or like an event, you know, they were really struggling with an event. If I were you, I would probably say something like, Hey, like, I don't want to come across as like promotional around my business, but I'm hearing you around your pain points around like X, Y, and Z. And like, this is something we particularly focus in. So like no pressure, you don't need to answer me now, but I just want to put out there that if there's a way in which we could support you, like we're here and, you know, and if we're not the right fit because of our personal relationship, that's totally fine. I'd be happy to tell you about other folks in this space, but I just, I hear the challenges that you're facing and I don't want to just like leave you hanging when I feel like I have access to resources. Mallory, are you um, interested in joining our strategic advisory board? (laughs) You're you're hired. Come on in. A little bit of equity for Mallory. Mallory will just hand out equity. (laughs) I'm throwing a party and I'm inviting people to join me. (laughs) No, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I love that. And and if they see their values, like what Ria Wong said, who's a, a friend of the podcast, a friend of ours too. She was on a couple of weeks ago and her episode's awesome. I highly recommend if you're listening to this, go listen to Ria's too when you're done with this one. And She's amazing. She is yeah. so incredible. And she said during your discussion, if people want to see their values manifested through the work that we're doing, they're more than welcome to join me on this journey. It's like mm-hmm. you're inviting people into their joy and into their values instead of asking. And Mm -hmm. you said offering, which I love that. Uh, That's, that's, it's such a good way to frame it. Yeah. And there's a lot of, you know, people are now there's more and more science to support this, but people were always a little bit 
thrown off when I said that a big part of my fundraising was like giving people an out. Like in my fundraising emails and my conversations, I would always say like, it is no problem whatsoever if this is not a right fit for you. But I'm hearing the way that you're talking about this. It's making me think there might be alignment here. And so are you interested in exploring this? But seriously, like no pressure if you're not. And people are always like, couldn't believe I was like letting people off the hook. And I did it because it made me as a fundraiser feel so much more comfortable. And because what I wanted was alignment, not money. And I say Power Partners is an alignment first methodology, not a money first methodology. Money, anyone can get a gift one time. Anyone can get that business one time. But if you want sustainable, reliable funding, then alignment is where to focus. And now there's all this science to support that actually when you give people opt outs, they're way more likely to say yes. No, it's not that surprising. It was not my strategy, but it's not that surprising because the reality is people trust you so much more when they don't think you just want their money at all costs, even if it's not the right fit for them. Yeah. So it's, it's going back to, it's, it's kind of like the, um, the, you've heard the analogy or, or maybe it's the, a, a metaphor, the, uh, uh, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, creating a win, win, win. And uh, it's really building network equity. And when you do that, mm -hmm. you're more you're more likely to get you know other networks like individuals who open up their networks to you because you're coming across as so authentic. Uh, mm -hmm. And I mean, you you really talk about the power of building real relationships, which is an art because you want to figure out ways to add value. How do you? Let's talk more about building real relationships, which I know we've already started, but maybe we could build on this more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think. You know, for me, building building real relationships, and there are a lot of podcasts about this where I've been looking at like the science and the research behind relationship building. And um, but I'll just talk about it maybe more personally and and come you know bring in some of those elements. I think for me, relationship building really comes down to, and actually Carol Robin talked about this on what the fundraising too, like being known and creating space for the other person to be truly known. Like I think when my relationship started to shift and become stronger, both as a fundraiser, but also in my personal life was when I dealt with a lot of my perfectionist tendencies, when I dealt with a lot of my people pleasing tendencies, and when I felt the ability to be appropriately authentic, right? It doesn't mean like I'm TMIing all over the place, but it, but I felt like I could let myself be truly known and then had my own back. I think like one of the most important things that allows us to build real relationships and to have that vulnerability to be open to real relationships is knowing that we're going to have our own back when those relationships don't work out. Because I think when relationships don't move in the direction we might want them to, and we go into our shame spirals about us not being good enough, like then it's super hard to go into that next relationship open, right? Because you're, again, you're in that protection mode. Um, so I almost think like that internal work around like the perfectionism, the people pleasing, the like how you support yourself, that those are such an important elements to keep yourself open to true connection. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I wrote down, um, there's actually a, an interesting book called Fearvana that's on the art of perfectionism and being like, a, like to, to put it how you put it, um, appropriately authentic. Mm. Um, if you haven't read or heard of that book, I would check it out. It's super cool. I, I mean, it's, I think that you've already, you've already worked past the challenge of, of trying to be, you know, trying to be perfect in everything that you do. Um, but it's just, it's just thought provoking. It's really thought. Yeah. I'm on book three or book four, I think in this conversation, I've got a yeah. lot of reading to do. <laughs> no, but I, I love that. And look, I mean, I call myself a recovering perfectionist. Like this is daily work. So I would say for folks who are listening, who are, who feel that way, like, oh, she's like, got it all figured out or, oh, she's already done all this. I am self-coaching myself around every single one of these principles every single day. This is like lifelong work. It's an, it's exercises, just like the other form of exercise that we do. 
these, these, this is brain exercise, um, because there's a lot out there. You were asking before about the binary thinking. One of the things I think that's important to remember is that there's a lot in our society that reinforces things like that. We are constantly marketed to in ways that reinforce scarcity. We are constantly, um, seeing news cycles that are completely binary. So if you feel like, oh yeah, I have been really thinking binary. It's no wonder you're surrounded by binary binary frameworks constantly. So it's not about beating yourself up for being trapped in a binary, but for starting to recognize it and have awareness around it and realize that when you want to, and if you want to, there are other ways. How do we, how do we shift from binary to the opposite of binary? And what is the opposite of binary? (laughs) Ah, see, I don't think there is an opposite of binary because I think that would be binary. When I think (laughs) of (laughs) <laughs> That's amazing. It's a virtuous cycle. <laughs> I mean, when I think about getting out of the binary, I think about going into the gray. So it's like, you know, when people people will come to me like in a fundraising lens all the time and they'll be like, what's the exact right way to say this to a funder? And I'm always like, there are 500,000 good ways to say that to a funder, probably more actually. And so it's about figuring out the way to say that to a funder that feels the most in alignment with you and that honors that relationship and that connection the most. And so I think one thing you can do to shift out of the binary is to just get curious and ask yourself, what might be one other way of doing this? What might be, or if I was so-and-so, how would I answer this question right now, right? Like put yourself in another I do this with teams all the time when they're struggling to make decisions. I make them all argue the perspective of somebody else on their team about what they want. Interesting. And so they start to realize that, okay, their perspective is not the only perspective. And that's the thing. With binary, we think, oh, we need to find the exact opposite truth. You don't. You need to just realize that you that there is not one truth. So what else might be true? What else might be possible? What's the exact opposite opinion of this? You just have to open your mind a little bit to the fact that there is not one perspective and one truth. Mm. So good. <laughs> this stuff is fun, huh? <laughs> yeah, for sure. What What's the most important thing going on in your life right now? Mm. Well... Gosh, I have a three and a half year old and your your 10 month old is now fast forward is now three and a half years old. I know. I know it happens very fast. It is such a fun age. I mean, it's all fun. It's all fun. I feel like every age I've gotten to, I have been like, you know, the next, the next, they can't get better than this. And then it, and then it somehow does. Um, and so, or not better, but just different and amazing and magical in a different way. So I, I love being, I love being a mom and I love my work. Um, and so I think, you know, and my, you know, my husband, my family. So I think the biggest thing for my life is just continuing to iterate, on what that harmony looks like with the ever-changing landscape of motherhood, of family planning, of having more kids in the future, um, and sort of figuring out how those pieces can continually fit together in ways that lead to a really joyful life. I mean, I think for me at the end of the day, like, that's all I want. Like, I just want to feel like I get to live, you know, not every day is great, of course, but um, that I get to look back on the year behind me or the week behind me or the month behind me and be like, I had a lot of fun. That felt really meaningful. I felt deeply connected to people um, and I feel really grateful for my life. And I I feel really grateful for my life. And I try to keep that um, at sort of the center of it all. I believe Albert Einstein said that you can look at everything in life as a miracle or nothing in life as a miracle. And one of my dear friends and mentors, Jeff Hoffman, who's coached me in business and has been my personal and professional mentor, he always says that success is appreciating the journey. It's not the destination. Mm -hmm. And um, you speak so much truth. Like every single day that I wake up and I'm like, you know, another day above ground is an incredible day. I just like put my hand over my heart and I meditate and I just bask in that feeling. And yesterday I, I bawled, I just, I just let it all purge and come through me. And it was just tears of gratitude. Like we were going through it. We're three years behind you, my wife and I, we have a, we have a three month old right now. 
and just like enjoying every single precious moment. It's just mm-hmm. been so incredibly like where I'm just in awe. I'm in awe mm-hmm. of the beauty of life. And I think everybody deserves to find that. And like, if you're not finding that with what you're currently doing and the work that you're doing, and um, that's what this podcast is all about is, is like exploring how people are using business as a means to genuinely make an impact, but not just for the world, for themselves too. So you feel mm-hmm. complete and fulfilled and grateful every single day you wake up and you're like, I get to do this. I get to make a difference. Mm-hmm. That's so beautiful. I I love what you said. And I just want to say, you know, like we talk so much in this business world about scale and we think about scale from a business perspective, from like a revenue perspective or, you know, company size perspective. And I just think about scale in my life too. Like, okay, I, I stop working early on Thursdays, like after this, because I'm going to take Emmy to ballet. And we're going to have, we have special dates on Thursday, her and I, and we go to ballet and then we pick up pizza and then we just like have this whole day. And like, that's scaling to me. Like I didn't used to take half days on Thursday. And like, that is like a scaling of my living, of my life, of my motherhood in ways that feel really good. And so I think as you know, especially maybe for the parents listening to this or whatever it is that you are trying to balance like a piece of your life with your business, I just think encourage you to like, I don't believe in work-life balance. I don't know what that means, but I think about like work-life harmony, you know, and like, what does it mean to, to live in that place of gratitude of harmony and knowing that there's, there are sure you can compare your like revenue line items to another business, but you're comparing a surface level thing, um, you know, and that's not the whole story. And so like, what is your whole story and what does it mean for you to like scale your life in the way that you want to. Amazing. Okay, this is my last book reference for the day. <laughs> oh my God, another book. Okay, all right, I'm taking it. I notes. just finished this one. <laughs> it's called Off Balance by Matthew Kelly. It was mm-hmm. recommended to me by my friend, Andrew Smallwood. Um, and it's all about the work-life balance myth and how it's mm-hmm. all BS. And it's like, you mm-hmm. have to find something that the more you pour into it, the more it pours into you and fills you mm. up. And when you find that thing, you're like, yes, I found it. Like, this is it. Mm. And, uh, and so many people go to work. I mean, you talk about like this capitalistic nature, like we are trying to, we go to work to buy things that we don't need to impress people we don't care about. And instead of doing that, like find something you love and be authentic and like represent, like just create value. And like, there's no shame in, in, in making money. Um, totally. Yeah. There's no shame in making money, like make money to be able to support your life. But there is shame in doing something that it's like getting to the end of your life at 60, 70, 80 years old. And like, damn, I wish I could do it over again. I would do it differently. I, I think it's like what I was saying before about Netflix. Like the thing is never bad. Money is not bad. Money is great. Like I want to make money. Like I want to live a comfortable life. Totally. But it's like, okay, is that money helping you feel the way that you want to feel? Is it actually building? Is it giving you the life that you want? Are you feeling relaxed or whole or passionate or any of those things, you know? And so it's just like, I think for me, it's always about like, I don't want to just do the thing for the sake of doing it. Cause some guru somewhere told me that's what success looks like. You know, it's like our bodies and our brains tell us what success is every single day by how we freaking feel. So like we can just like tap into that and like design around that. It's a totally different ballgame. Mallory, you seem like the type of person who would really uh, appreciate and respect the hustle culture. (laughs) Let me tell you, I was somebody who like 100% 100% was in the hustle culture for most of my careers in the nonprofit sector. I worked myself to the bone and I developed chronic pain as a result of it. And I, I mean, I hit a like real rock bottom that like led me to the journey of where I am today. And I, I don't want everyone to have to get to where I got, you know, to start a path of healing and different ways of being able to be. But yeah, like I, like so many people thought, I was not enough unless I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't, you know, anything enough. And the way I could be enough was, was hustling my face off. Mm. Wow. I'm yeah. I'm just letting that one sink in. That's, um, 
and what, and what was the biggest, what was the biggest shift for you? Like, how did you get out of that? I mean, coaching therapy, like, I mean, I'm, I'm a coach, but I am always getting coached and I, I just believe in coaching like so deeply. Um, and I think also the thing is, is like, and we talk about this in coaching a lot, this idea of one degree shifts. I think like when you're in a mode of being, you were asking before, like, how do we start to change who we are, how we are, you know, for me, and I talk about alignment a lot. It's like one degree shifts. Like you don't need to listen to this podcast and turn it off and be like, I'm going to be a totally different person. Like 180, here I go. You know, it's like, what's a one degree shift you can make in your life that, that points you a little bit closer to your North star. Maybe it's not working, not having your laptop open after five or six, a few days. So you can have have really focused family time. Like what's a one degree shift. And then I think we go through those little shifts. We survive them. We notice how they make us feel and they inspire us to take the next shift and the next shift and the next shift. And one degree shifts over a period of time leads to 180 degree shift. It leads to a complete reorientation. And that's what it did for me. And it was a little bit at a time surviving it, having a fallback, get, you know, catching myself back in an old tendency. Like I still, I still have days where I completely am in hustle culture. And then I come out of, I'm like, what the heck happened? Like, how did that, I just got scooped up in everything. And so it's like, these are, these are the systems around us. And I think it just takes like, at the end of the day, the thing that changed my whole life was ending a relationship that I had been in for a very long time. We were basically engaged and we bought a house together and I made everybody in my life very mad at me. <laughs> and, but I made the decision and I mean, it saved my life in a lot of ways. And, um, but I had this moment where I basically like, I had done the thing I never wanted to do. People were mad at me. They didn't like me. They said mean things to me. They like all the things I had spent, you know, 27 years trying to protect myself from. And at the end of the day, what I had to do was build my relationship with myself and say, what does it look like to have your own back through this, to walk yourself through this and, I, again, don't want that experience for anybody else, but in doing that, I learned how to have a healthy relationship with myself. And at the end of the day, that's what makes all this other stuff be able to, to stick. Mallory, who's the perfect person that like, who's the, the, the person that you most want to help right now? The things that you've just talked about, I mean, it sounds a lot like, you know, life coaching and, and therapy, but I know you also do the you know, fundraising, coaching and consulting as well. Is this all sort of a, an aggregate? Like, are you focused on like psychology and physiology in addition to the fundraising consulting component? Cause it all ties together. Yeah. So I'm really looking at the intersection of psychology and coaching and fundraising. So I'm particularly interested in helping fundraisers who feel are feeling that they are being held back because of perfectionism, people pleasing skills, you know, they feel like they're in this, they're stuck between shiny object syndrome and paralysis. They're in states where they're experiencing a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, a lack of clarity. They don't know the way forward. And they feel like fundraising is this mystery hidden under a rug. It feels wildly uncomfortable for them. And they want a different way to relate to money, to relate to fundraising, to relate to themselves and their own value and worth. Because that basically is like the intersection where this sits is like what is happening inside a fundraiser's head and body that holds them back from, from being able to take effective fundraising action. And so we get to do the personal work and the professional work together because it's all vulnerability. So it's all the same. Are there any questions during our conversation today that I did not ask that I should have asked that you'd like to explore now before we wrap up? I don't up? think so. I love this conversation. Good. I did too. I did too. I'm so glad to know you. I'm so, so glad that, um, and, and very grateful. I know we were supposed to chat last week and very much appreciate your flexibility oh and my gosh. having the conversation with me today. Super awesome. And you are worthy and you, you are incredible and you're brilliant and you have so much love to give and so much life and energy to share. Um, I'm just excited now that you're in my personal network and um, a couple hundred thousand people that'll be listening to this podcast as well. 
I'm, I, I'm uh, yeah. Just oh. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for the time, for the conversation. I feel like um, we should probably start a book club after this. <laughs> I just, yeah, I really, I really appreciate everything that you are putting out there and the conversations that you're nurturing and having and um, just how much alignment there was between the two of us in this conversation and how we think about these things. So thanks for teaching me a lot and, you know, giving me a lot to think about too. I'm really, I'm really grateful. All right, Mallory, final questions. Favorite book, movie. Oh, here we go again with the book. Oh gosh. Oh my gosh. Favorite oh my book, book, movie or podcast show. Bes okay. besides, besides your own, because we know that's your favorite podcast. <laughs> My favorite book at the moment, I can only do at the moment, is The Way of Integrity by Martha Beck. Highly, highly recommend. Um, and you want to hear the worst part? I don't listen to podcasts. Um, I know I'm not an auditory learner. And so I never listened to podcasts. It was a total accident that I created when I was telling my husband, I'm having all these amazing conversations that I wish I could share with people. And he was like, honey, that's a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, I guess I'll create a podcast. Um, so I, um, and then my favorite movie, um, probably still, is um, Shawshank Redemption. Oh, it's such a great one. Mm. Such a great one. What's the favorite, your favorite place you've ever traveled? Oh my God, that is so hard. So I spent seven months in Latin America. I love all of Latin America. Um, but I also have, a, I'm obsessed with Japan. So I'm gonna pick two. I'm gonna say Colombia and Japan, two very different, beautiful, incredible countries. Um, yeah places I would live in a heartbeat. And then last question, someone that inspires you that you think we should have on the podcast. So I would say, you know, it's funny. I don't even know her personally, but I'm so inspired by everything she puts on social media. So I'm just going to say it. anyway, Kia Kroom, she is a fundraising consultant. She's here in Oakland, California, I think. Um, and I just, I just love her energy. I love the way that she talks about fundraising and breaks it down and sort of shows up in this space. So she is one person um, I would think about. And then Someone I had on the podcast that I just adore um, is Vanessa Bonds. And she wrote this book called You Have More Influence Than You Think. Um, and she's just done some fascinating research around influence. Um, and we did, we split her episode into two episodes, one that was focused on um, the influence like for fundraisers and one that was focused on donors. And so there might be something interesting there around how you all think about events and creating some of those moments um, because I think we have some stigma around the word influence, but I really think about it as um, like she, and she really talks about it in a very like positive way. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Yeah. We'll be reaching out to them. Yeah. Okay. I know we're over. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you so much. I hope I'm not making you late for something right now. No, no, no. Perfectly fine. Um, I, I, and um, just last thing, cause I don't, I don't know if you've got something that you need to jump to. No, no, I don't. I'm okay. Okay, cool. How can, uh, how can our audience get in touch with you? Oh, yes. Okay. So they can follow me either on LinkedIn. You can find me at Mallory Bressler Erickson, um, or on Instagram underscore Mallory Erickson. My website is MalloryErickson.com. And if you're interested in, um, you know, working with me, the best way to do that is in a, an incredible community, the Power Partners Formula. So if you go to MalloryErickson.com backslash Power Partners, you can learn more about that as well. Um, but I would love to connect with you. Let me know you listen to this here say hi. Um, that would be wonderful. Mallory, thank you so much for being on the Impact Roadmap. It's been a pleasure and an honor to, uh, to spend some time with you today. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, if this episode was valuable to you, then uh, share it with someone that you love, someone that you know that could benefit from it. Also, be sure to subscribe. And depending on how you're listening, go ahead and leave a comment or review. This will help ensure that we are connecting with other nonprofit leaders so that we can get this critical information out to them. And if your company is in the early or even late stages of putting on an event, go to our website, utopiaexperience.com and click the book us tab and schedule a free discovery call to see if our services would be a right fit for your event. And even if they're not, that's okay. I promise you our expertise can steer you in the right direction. So you'll get value either way. Thanks for listening to the Impact Roadmap and we'll see you next time.